Thank you, Debbie. Um, thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, my colleague and myself, um, my colleague Millie Rogers and I are delighted to present to you the findings so far from our work in pre-approved talent scheme, um, which really is aiming to help bridge the skills gap. We call this a PATS for short. Um, Millie, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So, yeah, Millie and myself um, will present today's um, webinar. In late uh, spring this year, Millie and myself carried out a feasibility study and have been working on this PATS project ever since. Um, the agenda for today, I'm going to start off with some housekeeping. I'm going to give you a general introduction to the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, uh, which we refer to as NMIS. For those of you who have never attended one of our webinars before or NMIS is new to you, I'm going to provide a little bit of background and context to PATS, the pre-approved talent scheme. And we'll also then share with you the findings of a feasibility study that Millie and myself carried out um, in late spring this year. We'll then have some conclusions and some next steps. There will be plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. Thanks, Millie. Next slide, please. So to start off with housekeeping, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, during the webinar, your microphones and webcams will be turned off um, to avoid any background noise. You can type questions throughout the session via the chat tool and we'll answer these questions at the end of the session. It would be amazing if you could complete the survey that's sent out to you after the webinar just to help us with feedback. Next slide, Millie, please. So for those of you who have the, the NMIS is, a, is new to you, NMIS essentially brings together industry, academia and the public sector to work together. Our vision and mandate is to transform the manufacturing industry in Scotland and really to put Scotland at the front of forefront of advanced manufacturing. Next slide, please, Millie. NMIS is operated by the University of Strathclyde. It's part of the high value manufacturing catapult. It, and it, we are supported by a number of organisations which are represented here on this slide. Thank you, Millie. Next slide. NMIS consists of a number of core specialist centres. We have the Advanced Forming Research Centre, um, which is the longest running of our centres. The Lightweight Manufacturing Centre, our newly opened digital factory, which opened in June um, this year. And Millie and I are both team part of the Manufacturing Skills Academy. Next slide, please, Millie. So the Manufacturing Skills Academy is one of the core centres, um, specialist centres of NMIS. Um, NMIS Mandy is to put Scotland at the forefront of the manufacturing industry and the forefront of advanced manufacturing. Obviously, in order for Scotland to realise its full potential, it's important, critical to have the right skills in the right place at the right time. And the Manufacturing Skills Academy, we call ourselves MSA for short. We are working with employers, we're working across um, universities and other educational establishments um, to support employers in addressing these skills gaps. So we work across the edu educational landscape and life cycle. So we are working right from primary school 
through to um, people who are getting towards the end of their career. So we're working primary school, we do outreach, secondary schools, colleges, universities, undergraduates. We run a highly successful intern program. We have a doctoral centre. We offer CPD. Um, so we are really working right across this entire educational um, life cycle. Next slide, please, Millie. OK, so today's uh, webinar is going to focus on PATS, the pre-approved talent programme. And this slide just gives you some background as to where the pre-approved talent scheme came from. Um, essentially, you'll all be aware that there's been ongoing and forecast um, skills and labour market shortages. There has been a struggle to match supply and demand. It became um, obvious to us that there's many large employers who attract huge numbers of applications, so they have um, the brand and the resources in place to attract and process these applications. Whilst some smaller organisations can struggle to attract suitable applicants. We also um, found that on occasions, um, people, if they're applying within engineering and manufacturing, if they're not successful in um, gaining employment within a few months, they will consider moving to other sectors. And therefore, this talent is lost from Scotland's education system and also lost to the engineering and manufacturing industry. So PATS is really about ensuring that we keep this talent within Scotland. So it focuses on apprenticeships and graduates, applicants and candidates. Um, and essentially, how it works is um, where we, it creates a unique talent pool from apprentice and graduate applicants who have been interviewed, gone through the assessment centres, passed the competency tests and performed at an, an outstanding level. So throughout this process, so fundamentally, they are employable by the company that they're being assessed by. However, as we all know, many employers have a limited number of spaces. So, for instance, there may be 16 candidates who meet the employability threshold out of 300, but there may only be space for six. That's essentially takes these 10 pre-approved candidates and creates a, a unique talent pool from, from them. Next slide, please, Millie. So these candidates who have already been assessed, performed well, are employable, are used to create a, a unique pre-approved talent pool that can then be shared throughout the community. So across smaller organisations and larger organisations um, to ensure that this talent remains within the sector and also within Scotland. Next slide, please, Millie. OK, so, yeah, uh, so kind of... I'm just going to hand over now to my colleague, Millie, who's going to take us through the feasibility study um, background and also some of the findings um, of the feasibility study. Thank you, Millie. Thanks, Avril. Um, yeah, so kind of following on from that, we earlier in the year we ran a feasibility study. So this kind of hoped that we would engage with a lot of different uh, members within like industry, kind of like government, students and apprentices themselves, potential graduate job seekers um, to just really get that kind of feel of, you know, is this something the labour market is looking for? Would it be practical? Would it 
kind of be of benefit to people. Um, so I guess like the kind of main aim of this when we were looking into it was, you know, the ability to attract and retain more young people in the manufacturing and kind of engineering sectors is just sort of reiterating what Avril was saying. A lot of young people were finding big challenges when looking for jobs and they were saying if they weren't able to find a job in that sector within kind of like a few months, they would look to other sectors. And obviously, you know, if we've kind of made that investment in young people through education up here, we want to make sure we're not losing that to other sectors. Um, so kind of secondly, then just, you know, this, the following on with that, the scope was just to understand how this might contribute towards retaining a greater number of people in Scotland as well. So not even just kind of finding them in the sort of manufacturing and engineering sectors, but just making sure we're not losing them potentially down to other countries or down to London, um, other places like that. As again, you know, we've kind of made this significant investment in their education. Um, also looking at the benefits this can bring to employers. So we're not just kind of looking at SME employers or larger employers, we're just looking at how we can benefit everybody within the sector um, and within these industries. And finally, just to just try and understand a bit better how underrepresented groups might benefit from this as well, um, as we want to make the kind of, I guess, like concept as inclusive um, as everybody, for everybody as we possibly can. So, the methodology that we ran with was in um, kind of between Scottish Apprenticeship Week, Avril ran a webinar. So this was very early on just to get an initial idea of, you know, like, is this something that's worth kind of investing more time into uh, just to kind of get a bit of a feel for it. And then once we'd kind of done that, uh, we then progressed with an online survey. So within this, we just kind of tried to keep it um, as concise as we could, uh, as we could, and just try and get, you know, some like in-depth um, responses from people is just to get opinions and ideas, um, kind of any challenges, anything like that, how we thought it might actually work. Um, so this was really useful and this was kind of shared via um, LinkedIn, email, um, a couple of newsletters, things like that. So I'll talk through the results of that in a minute in a bit more detail. We also ran a number of interviews with individual organisations. So these kind of covered larger employers, SMEs, and they were really beneficial just to get that kind of greater uh, insight into their answers um, and just kind of, you know, get opinions on how they felt it might benefit them, what the challenges they saw were, um, things like that. We also then ran a number of focus groups with different stakeholders. So these included large employers, SMEs, applicants themselves, um, or potential applicants, and then government and educational organizations too. So again, these were really good to kind of get a, a more um, and like intimate setting for people uh, just to share their ideas and challenges. But I also provided some really interesting discussions as within some of the focus groups, we had like a few different employers. So it was really good to hear, you know, what might be a challenge for one might work for another um, and how we could kind of bounce those ideas off each other. And then finally, we also ran a LinkedIn campaign as well. So this just kind of was how we shared what was going on with the project um, and kind of like the survey and focus groups too. So first, the kind of participants we had for the online survey. So we had responses from over 30 different organisations. So this was really good, you know, to just provide us with a really kind of overview um, of the labour market in this area. Um, and just under 20 different organisations were also represented across the focus groups and interview sessions that we ran. So, you know, we kind of felt this gave us a really good overview of a whole range of different sectors within manufacturing and engineering and kind of different um, company sizes too. So we spoke to a few larger employers, a mix of SMEs, um, and it just kind of helped us really get a gauge on what would kind of work for the majority of people um, and how we could kind of, I guess, put something into place um, or start generating a few ideas. Um, so the survey results that we ran, we had 34 responses. So these came from a whole range of different people. Um, the sectors included uh, where we received responses from were manufacturing, engineering, the government, renewables, education. And that's just to kind of name a key few. We had a few others um, as well, but I think this helped to give us a really um, good overview of all the different sectors um, and made sure it was pretty representative across the labour market. Uh, so the graph that I'll talk through in a second 
uh, just kind of highlight this a bit further. Um, and we also had a really good mix of responses across the whole of Scotland too, which was something we were really keen to make sure that this was a pan Scotland project and not just kind of focused within Glasgow where we're based or the central belt too. Um, so in terms of the organization, organization sizes, um, the kind of largest number of people we spoke to um, were in organizations that had either 50 to 249 employees or 250 plus employees. Um, and then the kind of, I guess, like key parts was we really wanted to understand firstly where organizations were recruiting from um, is this kind of until we can bring in, I guess, like a as concept until we know um, where they're recruiting from. It's hard to kind of, I guess, try and fit with um, what would suit for them. So the kind of most popular places where they were recruiting from was direct liaison with education institutions. So this included things like attending university careers events, um, kind of going speaking to university students, universities then emailing out about job job opportunities. Um, but this was primarily from larger organisations, um, which was something we were aware of as well. And then the other most popular answer was self-advertising. Um, so these were kind of really interesting to us as obviously a lot of the SMEs we spoke to didn't have the same um, capacity to kind of interact with educational institutions and attend a lot of these events as some of the larger companies did. Um, and then again, through self-advertising, larger organisations also had uh, typically larger budgets to do this um, and kind of more staff time as well. So that's where we really believed parts would be able to support um, that initiative. And uh, again, of the 34 companies that uh, responded to this, 24 of them said they did find it difficult to recruit suitable graduates and or apprentices. Um, so I think, you know, that's very clearly over kind of half of all respondents with uh, finding these kind of challenges. So again, I think this really kind of reiterated where we could come in with the PATS project. So here again, we then would ask, we were asking, would your organization be interested in sharing these candidates? So 30 of 34 said they would be interested, which again, kind of shows a really positive, overwhelming response to that. Um, and some of the key reasons stated why are just shown in the graph on the right here. So the most popular one was to help young people secure jobs faster. And obviously, you know, when I guess they're graduating or they're looking for new opportunities, we kind of want people to be in jobs as much as we can. Um, and we kind of don't want, I think, kind of tying back to what we'd said before, if candidates didn't find jobs within those first few months, they would then look elsewhere. So I think you know, being able to help people secure jobs faster is really positive. Um, some of the kind of other ones uh, that were also quite popular was just that it would help to uplift the whole sector. So a couple of interesting kind of bits of feedback we had were even if, say, one organisation organization couldn't take them on, if they were still a really good candidate, another organisation would be able to. And then in the longer term, that's only going to benefit the whole sector. Um, if everybody's kind of more productive or has be better quality candidates. Um, also, just kind of a couple other reasons, you know, that duty to young people, also to help local quality candidates too. Um, you know, like kind of again linking back to that pan Scotland idea, and to just help make recruitment more efficient for a lot of people too. If you've already kind of got a pool of good candidates, um. Moving on, one more than the previous one, we had 31 of 34 people would be interested in gaining access to strong but unsuccessful candidates. Um, and the kind of key reasons stated here again were to just help widen their talent pool. As you know, if you've kind of got a wider access to better uh, potential candidates, you know, I think very few people are going to say no to that uh, in terms of recruitment. And it would also help to make the recruitment processes more efficient. And um, particularly when we'd spoken to a couple of SMEs, they said, you know, they didn't have as much time to do these sort of things. So if they've got a pool of potentially good candidates that have been pre-approved, then that would help them save a lot of time in the long run too. Um, so I think, again, this kind of shows, you know, some like really positive steps. And then a couple of people just at the end that also said it would help improve diversity. So I think that's, you know, like a really positive step that we're really wanting to make sure is included through the PATS project too. Um, 
so kind of on the other side, we also wanted to see, you know, as much as we think this is a good idea, what are the potential challenges that exist and how can we help overcome these? So the largest of these is GDPR. Um, so I think kind of maybe Avril will discuss that later in a little bit of detail, but we, you know, how can we kind of produce this platform with existing recruitment processes, but make sure that all details are being shared in um, the best way. So we kind of looked at this and potentially thought if a candidate could sign up themselves, then they agree to share their own details rather than having to cross that boundary from a larger organisation. Um, and then another uh, thing stated was just that what are the kind of pre-approved standards? So what may be a good candidate for one company might not be for another. Um, and we kind of like discussed this with a few people and we sort of kind of came up with the definition of if a company had been willing to take on a candidate themselves but just didn't have that space, then we would deem that as pre-approved. Um, so that's kind of how we were trying to define that one. Um, and just to kind of wrap the sort of survey and some of the discussions together in a few short conclusions, um, the key recruitment sources were just the self-advertising recruitment agencies and three direct liaison. Um, but a lot of them did bring big limitations for SMEs. Uh, again, I think this just shows, you know, how popular this could be is that 88% of respondents said they would be willing to share pre-approved candidates, just saying that there was that duty to young people and the labour market. Um, and it would just kind of help to uplift everybody. Again, 91% said they would also be interested in gaining access to these candidates. So I think those kind of super high numbers really show the demand for this in the labour market too. Um, the largest identified issues were GDPR and those minimum criteria standards. But I think when you kind of look at the overwhelming positive responses compared to a couple of identified issues which we can work around in early stages I think it just really shows the positive impact um, this could potentially have um, so I'll pass back over to Avril who's going to talk through some of the focus groups and interviews that we also ran. Yeah, thank you Millie that was great. Um, Millie has got done a great job of presenting the survey results which really primarily focused on quantitative um, results. Um, we also ran a number of focus groups and interviews which provided more kind of qualitative feedback about PATS. Um, I'm just going to run through these just now. Um, I'll run through first of all the sort of the general positives and then some of the kind of more practical issues um, that Millie and I um, have been working on uh, with a group of stakeholders to identify solutions for. In general, there was overwhelming positive support for the PATS concept. Um, everyone we spoke to was really keen about the idea of keeping talent within the engineering and manufacturing sector um, and also putting greater opportunity for candidates and really helping the reach of um, organisations. So overall, positive support for PATS. Next slide, Millie, please. OK, there was also a very clear requirement and demand for PATS that came through on our focus group. Um, I won't go through all of these quotes, um, but we talked to organisations who have over 3000 applicants, but they only have 200 positions um, and fundamentally they were giving us feedback like, oh, we interviewed some really great candidates that we would have loved to have taken on. And, you know, afterwards, they often wonder what happened to these candidates. You know, did they get work in engineering and manufacturing? Did they get another apprenticeship? Um, so there was a clear demand and requirement. Also, um, employers highlighting things such as, you know, obviously there is an existing skills gap, but this is set to grow with um, issues around retirement and ageing population. Some organisations point out that also they find it hard to get good candidates to apply or good candidates at interview. Next slide, please, Millie. In terms of sharing talent, 
and this opportunity for employers to essentially share these pre-approved uh, talent within a unique talent pool. Again, there was overwhelming support for this. Um, so generally, employers were really happy to share this talent around, to support the industry, um, and the fact that people move around the sector anyway, and it fuels the supply chain and strengthens that supply chain. There was overwhelming support for this. Next slide, please, Millie. Another uh, couple of key themes that came out was how PATS extends the reach of organisations and um, enables them to reach candidates that they may not have previously been able to, they may not have been aware of. Um, and also the fact that potentially sometimes organisations are looking for specific skills, which can be more challenging to find um, and having a pre-approved talent pool could potentially help them find and fill these positions. There was also a theme that emerged around creating networks and connections, extending reach. So, for instance, SMEs pointing out the fact that normally they rely on existing contacts, but this would really extend their reach and provide a, a, a new network. And also for the candidates themselves, um, providing them with um, you know, access to organisations that they may not have known um, existed. Next slide, Millie, please. Um, another key theme that emerged was the cost and efficiency savings around using this type of approach. Um, obviously, the application process um, can be quite long for candidates and there are several stages um, that can run over several months um, and a lot of candidates, um, you know, they don't want to go through this repeatedly. Um, so it would create efficiencies here. Also the fact that it's creating a unique talent pool of pre-approved talent, whilst organisations if they use the talent pool to identify suitable candidates, would obviously do their own um, duty um, and interviews, etc. It does streamline the recruitment process somewhat to have access to pre-approved talent that has already been through a number of stage gates and has passed and excelled every one of them. Next slide, please, Millie. Diversity inclusion obviously is so important um, and many organisations have clear targets. This was identified again as a, you know, a key benefit to PATS, um, allowing to extend that network and reaching people from a wider set of backgrounds. And clearly it is um, a key consideration for employers at the moment. Next slide, please, Millie. Um, we also got some really good feedback from the applicants themselves um, in terms of, so we ran some focus groups with potential um, candidates for apprenticeships and uh, graduate positions. Um, and some of the key findings that came out of that were that a lot of these candidates are, are applying to large organisations because they're aware of the brands, um, they are aware of their recruitment processes, they're, they're out there and they're clear, um, but potentially they're not aware of opportunities that are suitable for them with smaller organisations. Everyone that we spoke to said they would be keen to work for a smaller employer um, and as keen to work for a smaller employer as they are to work with larger employers. Um, but they weren't sure who to apply to and they also weren't sure if they were suitable for that type of organisation. A lot of them also said 
that they would be more likely to accept a job offer if um, it was through this type of approach. So if, for instance, they were given the opportunity to join the pre-approved talent scheme and were contacted through that by an employer, they would feel um, really engaged and more likely to accept that position because the offer has someone has approached them rather than them applying. They felt that would give them a massive con confidence boost and sense of belonging to that organisation. Um, also, again, um, the lengthy application processes that exist for and the, the number of stage gates that, that exist, um, potentially not having to go through that multiple times was seen as a, a huge benefit. Next slide, please, Millie. Some of the challenges um, and practical issues that need to be considered. Um, Pats, obviously, we've talked quite a lot about keeping talent in Scotland. Um, and, you know, the boost and the benefit this could have to the, the Scottish economy. Um, what we found was that many organisations actually, this potentially could be a barrier um, because they have a UK presence or wider and that their recruitment process and acquisition team are based across the UK um, and are centralised in um, a number, uh, one location that may or may not be within Scotland. Um, so this was highlighted as something, a practical consideration that we would need to take into um, consideration. Next slide, Millie. Millie picked up on this one earlier um, around standardisation. Clearly, there are some organisations for apprenticeships and graduates who are looking for um, potentially a degree in a specific area or um, qualifications. It might be hires or National 5 uh, qualifications in specific subjects. Um, and also, what might be good for one company may not be good for another. So there's different um, different levels of standardisation of what people consider to be good. Fundamentally, the minimum criteria that we would be looking at is that these candidates have uh, passed and excelled at every stage of the recruitment process and are deemed employable by the, the um, organisation that they're being assessed by. So they would employ them themselves. So essentially, that company would endorse that candidate as someone they would employ, but it just so happens they don't have room or space at that particular time. The PATS um, scheme itself, we envisage would have a filter which would allow um, organisations accessing the talent pool to filter for certain subjects or certain qualifications um, within that pool of pre-approved talent. Another um, key consideration that came up was a uh, GDPR. Millie mentioned this. Um, we have been working, uh, we, we ran a, a workshop uh, late summer um, and we worked again with a number of stakeholders. Um, so we across large organisations, small organisations, government, candidates themselves. Um, and the way that PATS would get around this would be that essentially, once candidates have been deemed employable, those organisations would let the candidate know that they performed exceptionally well, but haven't been selected for them to haven't um, can't be employed at this time, but they will offer them the opportunity to join the pre-approved talent scheme. It would so this then gives the responsibility to the candidate themselves to join the pre-approved talent scheme. So essentially, at this point, they are giving their um, approval for their. Uh, 
details, etc., to be shared across um, other organisations. Next slide, please, Millie. Another practicality that came up was around the fact that a recruitment for apprenticeships has high volumes, tight timescales, and that these timescales may vary um, for different organisations. The same with graduate programmes, um, so they're not all necessarily in sync. Um, and that there needs to be careful consideration given to each company's recruitment process, timelines, etc. And essentially, it's important for the PATS scheme to make life as easy as possible for companies. Next slide, please, Millie. So in conclusion, we found that there was overarchingly positive feedback for PATS and support from within the sector um, across Scotland. We found that organisations and employers were keen to help ensure that talent stays in manufacturing and engineering within Scotland and they also felt it would increase the efficiency um, and reach and diversity of their recruitment process. Next slide, please, Millie. Whilst we did identify a number of practical issues, um, we have developed approaches to overcome these. The next steps uh, for the Manufacturing Skills Academy are to uh, run a pilot study of PATS. So we would like to work with large organisations, SMEs, candidates, um, and actually make PATS real and come to life um, across a, a pilot study. We are at the moment exploring funding um, which would enable such a pilot study. And we are also looking for participants um, to take part in such a pilot study. OK, next slide, please, Millie. Um, so this is uh, Millie and my contact details. We have some time now for Q and A. Um, also, if you wish to get in touch with us um, and have further conversations around Pat's, Millie and I would be delighted to do this. Or if you feel you would like to participate in a pilot study of Pat's, you can also uh, get in touch about this as well. So, what we'd like to do now is just to spend some time answering some questions if we have any. Well, I'm not sure if you can actually see the chat box or not, um, but there doesn't seem to be any questions there at the moment. Um, yeah, I see, I see some comments, uh, which is uh, great. Previously. Thank you yeah. for those. Um, I don't see any questions at all. Oh, looks like there's one just come in. OK, so. I'll just read this question out. How beneficial do you think this would be for higher education learning providers? Do learning providers would be. Oh, sorry, it seems like there's a word missing here. Do you think learning providers would be more facilitated the use of this by letting employers know about it. I think obviously 
Um, I, I, I'm happy to answer this and then I'll hand over, uh, hand over to Millie. I think obviously for higher education learning providers um, and other education learning providers, uh, PATS is clearly, uh, I think, beneficial to them. Um, many of these organisations, obviously, they've put a huge amount of time, effort, energy into educating their young people and to see them um, getting gainful employment within the sectors that they've been educated in is highly beneficial to them. Um, there are also statistics that exist around um, educational establishments um, in terms of their employment success or employment amongst graduates um, and people who've taken particular courses within six months of graduating or leaving the course. So I do think it would be highly beneficial. Um, I think obviously educational and learning providers, it, it could be helpful for them to let employers know about this um, as well. Um, obviously, we're working across a wide range of employers, but the more people that we can let know about PATS um, and obviously within specific disciplines, there may be particular employers that those learning establishments are working with. And um, so I see it as being something that's beneficial to the learning providers, but also learning providers being involved in this process could benefit employers and candidates as well. Um, Millie, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to add to that. No, I think you pretty much kind of covered everything um, I had. I, I think as you were saying, yeah, just kind of, you know, if we can try and reach as many people as possible through that. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're really wanting to help kind of young people um, and help them secure, you know, like secure enjoyment, uh, enjoyment, sorry, secure employment in jobs that they enjoy um, and kind of really help benefit that wider sector as well. So I think kind of, you know, working with higher education learning providers and employers and the young people as well would just kind of benefit everybody. OK, so the next question is, it's actually a few questions wrapped into one, which is great. I always like someone getting <laughs> a wee two for one. Um, sounds great and really beneficial to the candidates. Thank you. Is the vision for the system to be live and maintained and updated in real time? Um, what I'll probably do is just answer that one first off before we move on to the next bit. So, yes, um, it would be live and maintained and updated in real, real time. And then the next question is, would someone need to take responsibility for this? And how would you measure the impact to ensure the success of this system? Um, Millie, I don't know if you want to have first bite at this. I'm happy to, to do that. Um, or would uh, someone need to take responsibility for this? And how would you measure the impact to ensure the success of this system? I think kind of firstly, someone would need to take initial responsibility for this so I think you know just kind of ensuring the program is up and running and it is maintained just to make sure it's kind of serving everybody in the best possible way it could um so I think that's what we're kind of hoping to do with our next steps for the project um is to kind of have you know like some of our time um to just help kind of make this a reality um to start with and I think to kind of help uh measure the impact I think it would just be you know kind of trying to retain as much kind of like individual contact with learners employers to just ensure you know like is it working for everybody is it as effect as effective as it could be as well um you know like are people able to get what they want out of the system um you know like has it I, I guess probably it, it depends how you would quantify success sometimes I think maybe in terms of the data side of things you could look at you know how long did it take a candidate to find another role or how long did it take an employer to find suitable candidates did it save time on their employment uh, or interview process um like that kind of thing but i think you could also sort of quantify it as you know like are people getting things out of the process as well um i don't know if you have anything else to add on to that avril um, yeah, so I think fundamentally what we'd like to do is to run a pilot study. 
um, which I think will iron out many of these things. So clearly someone would have to take, um, look after this and maintain it in real time and take responsibility for, for it. We see this as being something the Manufacturing Skills Academy would initially do. But we are looking to collaborate across organisations. And in fact, we've been talking with a number of stakeholders. So it might not be once Pats is up and running, it might be something that we hand over to another organisation who is more suitably placed um, to do this. Um, but definitely that responsibility is there. In terms of measuring the impact of the success of the system, so Millie mentioned a few things. We would be looking also at things like what size the talent pool was, how many people are recruited from the talent pool, um, how satisfied users of the talent pool and all the stakeholders were. And again, this is really something that we want to, we want to collect this type of data through um, a pilot study that we run with a limited number of organisations. Um, and I do see there's a question at the bottom that says, for the pilot study, would you be looking for SMEs to participate? Yes, we would be looking for SMEs um, and stakeholders and employers from across uh, the sector of all sizes to, to participate. Um, so I think we've got a few questions in between, um, let me just see where we've got to. Okay. Have you given any thought to academic entry requirements for modern graduate apprenticeships? Different learning providers have different entry requirements. So although a candidate may be pre-approved via a recruitment process for one learning provider, they may not meet the entry requirements for other learning providers. Um, I think this is something that came up really quite clearly from our survey and our focus groups that different criteria, different entry requirements. So yes, candidates could be pre-approved. They may interview well, they may excel um, at the recruitment process, but perhaps they don't have the right require the right um, qualifications for another employer. Um, we feel that PATS would have a filter on it that would allow um, organisations to search within the talent pool for, for people who meet their criteria. So this could be based on their qualifications, it could be based on their uh, the degree programme that they've come from, it could be based on their school qualifications, it might be based on where they are located. So there could be a number of filters that are applied. So it is something that we've thought of. Um, thank you for for raising it and it's something that um, we are looking to um, essentially ensure is embedded in the specification of the PATS. Okay, another question. Are you linking with the colleges from a higher education perspective? We see a lot of HNC, HND candidates choosing not to progress to university. There may be a pool of students there and raise aware, awareness with this group of students. Um, so, yeah, we are looking to work with people who are potentially um, apprentice candidates and not looking to progress to um, higher university. Um, we have been, there have been a number of colleges um, that have taken part in our um, feasibility study. We would also be keen to work with colleges and universities as part of our pilot study. So again, if this is something you're interested in, please uh, get in touch with Millie and or myself. Okay, I think that's all of the questions, unless there are any more coming through. Oh, one more. It's quite <laughs> a long one. Um, okay, so I'll just read this out. It's quite a long one. Good morning to you all from Edinburgh Napier University. Um, good morning to you as well. It's lovely to have um, such a wide range of organisations represented today. I am Head of Employer Engagement there 
in our career service. I agree on the clear value of this scheme to industry, our graduates from FE and HE, and indeed the Scottish economy. The graduate recruitment space, however, lacks university or college direction because, because to no outcomes, we are reliant on applicant and employer decisions being shared with us. And there is no requirement to do so by either employers or graduates. The latter are surveyed 50 minute, 15 months after they graduate, but completion rates are around 50% overall with wide variations at subject level. Keen to know how the talent pool would be managed and who would manage this and share the info. Thank you. Um, so thank you for this. Um, essentially, this would be something that we would explore through our pilot study. So fundamentally, we do want to collect data around who has been um, you know, the size of the talent pool is would be easy to um, get a handle on, but it could be potentially more challenging to find out which candidates have been recruited from the talent pool um, and what that sort of timeline is, success rates, etc. how many are retained in the sector. This is all data that we would be looking to collect from our pilot study and also as you point out, there are challenges around this in terms of um, candidates and employers sharing this information. So it's something that we really want to investigate um, further and um, look into through our pilot study. Thanks for your comment. OK, I don't see any other questions unless anyone's still typing um that's us at five two or just approaching five two um i would just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for attending today and thank everyone for your interest in hats um, and also for the really valid comments and questions that have come through please feel free to keep in touch with Millie and myself or reach out to us if you would like to know more details. We obviously have presented a summary of findings today um, or indeed if you are keen to participate in a pilot study um, or if you're not sure about participating in a pilot study but would like to talk more about it and what that would entail, uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you all. Um, and I hope that you have uh, a nice lunch <laughs> as lunchtime's now approaching. Thanks all.